Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the 10 Golden Rules Internet Marketing for Law Firms podcast and uh, web, you know, I guess webinar. We're putting this on YouTube as well. We have one of the greatest guests today, uh, Greg Crabtree, the author of Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits. And uh, I was lucky enough to see Greg speak at Seven Figure Agency, my mastermind. Greg, welcome to the 10 Golden Rules podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jay. Appreciate it. And um, so the reason I'm so excited about this one is uh, I, I actually read the book and I want to share just a short story. So I'm doing a program called 75 Hard. And 75 Hard, if you've heard about it, you have to do two workouts a day. You have to follow a diet. You have to no no cheat meals, no alcohol, drink a gallon of water and read 10 pages of a nonfiction book. So it was great because I don't know, for those of you who listen to the podcast know, you know, an accounting book might not be my go-to. Um, and, and then, so th this is what I've been able to accomplish where I'm on day 73 of 75 hard. Um, who, not how, it was fantastic. Um, Dan, Dan Sullivan, um, never person again was great. Uh, this, is, this one's currently on the reading list. And then this yeah. next up, the five dysfunction team. Yeah. So, that is, uh, that's been great for me. But today we're going to talk about simple numbers, but I wanted to, oh, I wanted to share the tip. So the tip is you have to read 10 pages of a nonfiction book. And, you know, when you do that, and, and then you, sometimes you get into it and read 20 or 25 pages, you know, I've been, I've been banging through books because when you have that discipline, um, a lot of book, these business books are 200, 250 pages. So, you know, seven, eight days, you're getting through business books. So highly recommend 10, give yourself a discipline, 10 pages. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Greg, and then we'll, we'll get into his story because it's m more interesting than mine. Um, you know, he has an entrepreneurial background, and, and he's a real financial expert, but he's the author of, of this book, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits. Um, and, and, you know, really, this is um, what I've loved about it, because we started working with, with Greg's company, is it's, it's, it's just the most common sense accounting I've ever seen in my career. And, you know, we're going on 30 years. Like one of the simple things is they do quarter, they, they look at quarterly rolling for projections. Because if you look at like, fortunately our company's growing. And when you look at, you know, 12 months or you look at last year for projections, you know, you sometimes you're looking at 18 month old data. So uh, some simple things like that, that, that Greg will explain much better than I can. Uh, the, the, the firm is called Crabtree, Rowe and Berger, a firm that specializes in helping entrepreneurs and business owners understand their financials to improve profitability and scale their business. Uh, but like I said, Greg can say it a lot better than me. So Greg, tell us a little bit about, you know, your journey and how you got started and how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Well, actually a uh, little bit of an update, I guess, to, uh, that was an older bio. Uh, in 2020, our firm merged with a uh, top U.S. accounting firm, Carm. So we're now a special consulting unit of a top 20 U.S. accounting firm. Uh, but we're referred to as simple numbers. And so so the focus of our practice came from one is I hate accounting. Uh, so uh, it, it's just one of those things that is like, gee, this it was built out of a mindset that this has to be easier than what we're making it. And, and, and fortunately, I guess I come from a long enough time ago that when I started in accounting, we were a principles based profession rather than a rules based profession. And then with some famous regulatory failures of Enron and uh, Arthur Anderson disappearing and those things, it, it just continued to push the, 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 the industry towards rules. And if you know anything about rules, especially I'm talking to a bunch of lawyers, you know, uh, the, the, the concept in, in legal is the more you try to define something, the easier it is to defeat. The words you use, it it becomes, you create unintended consequences, unintended loopholes. And so the, the world of accounting became for accountants and bankers and third parties, not for business owners that, hey, we, we forgot the most important person, the owner of the business. And, 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 and the thing was, the data should have had a lot more in, intuitiveness to it. And so 
over the years, I was fortunate to work with some really successful entrepreneurs, uh, and I just kind of dug into their brain and said, you know, what are you looking at? Because you're not look, you know, you don't take my financial statements and run your business by it. You're looking at something else. What is it? And and over time, and and doing some research, one of the things I did that is, uh, I I will I will challenge people if you really want to make a difference is start looking at data when nobody's paying you to do it, and. I think that no, very few accountants ever will even remotely think about doing. I just took a bunch of our client data and organized it in a way to start studying it. And in that organization process, we were just, we just stumbled on some plain truths that have been hiding in plain sight for decades. And you know, one of those that that you know, we always start off on is gross margin. Revenue is not the most important number. It's revenue minus cost of goods that go out to a third party. If it's materials in the services world, if you're talking about law firms, law firms can subcontract out things, out-of-pocket expenses on cases, uh, or even just pass through some of the work to some other contracted party. You're the billing face, but somebody else is doing that work, and you're getting a piece of that. Well, it's that piece is the true value add. And so gross margin, the way we define it, is before any of your internal labor. And then the, the next big aha, I'm, I'm telling you, this audience that I'm talking to is, you're, you're the perfect fit for this. You need $2 of gross margin for every dollar of labor, whether it's billable labor, non-billable labor, or somebody sweeping the floor. And, you know, that that's the, the magic number. And... And it's one of those that once you start to set these targets, then you can dig into the why. And and so, you know, and we have some other nuances that I write about in both books, you know, but 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 the idea being, you know, who's producing, who's not producing, who's in blended roles. And there's ways to interpret that data that we've, we've become very adept at and the fact that we've, we've done it for quite a long time. And then the other aspect that really emerged this discussion of creation of profitability, but what's the right amount of profitability? Fortunately for me, I, I, uh, I'm in a group called the Entrepreneurs Organization. Uh, I've been a member since 2001. And as a member leader in that organization, one of the things I get to do is I get to chair an executive ed class at Wharton Business School each year that I get to deliver some of the content as well. So as I, I like to joke, I mean, I'm just a kid from Alabama that grew up on a chicken farm. so. You know, getting to actually hang out and present information next to legit professors uh, is, is really cool. But the first year I was in that program, David Wessels, our lead professor, who I just think the world of, um, you know, David introduced me to the concept of return on invested capital. And so it was the missing link that uh, I remember reading the audio book for the first book 10 years after it was written. Uh, so I went to audit, the recording studio in 21 to, to read it uh, for audio. And, you know, I hadn't read it in 10 years. I mean, so it's like, what am I going to see in there that I don't like? And, you know, when I finished, I remember having this little moment to myself. Man, that was a pretty good book. <laughs> so I was, I was pleased with it. It's, a, it's and, a funny thing, right? Like I've gone yeah. back and read my, my first book, yeah. Golden Rules, speaking of rules. Yeah. Uh, the 10 Golden Rules of Internet Marketing. I, I wrote it 21, 22 years ago, and mm -hmm. people quote things to me from it, and then I go back and read the chapter, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that was pretty interesting. <laughs> That's right. Well, the thing was, I don't know if this happened to you or not, but I, when I read it, though, I had forgotten all of the little Easter eggs of thoughts that I left unanswered in the first book of where I was musing about, I was still missing a piece to the, to the recipe. And return capital was the final piece because essentially now we basically set the four cornerstones of business performance. And so the first one being you got to get a return on invested capital of at least 50% or more. And for law firms, you probably should be closer to the 75%. And the argument for that. Down, yeah. we, let, let's go back to gross margin if, if, yeah. if we can, and we'll, we'll get sure. to the return on invested capital. Mm -hmm. the, like, for for someone starting out in business, and 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 for people who haven't figured this stuff out yet, and fr frankly, I was one of them until recently. You know, a lot of our focus was on sales, revenue, revenue, right. revenue, revenue. Yeah. And 
you talked about gross margin. So like to simplify it way down, if you would, you know, a, a million dollar business, million dollar law firm, what does it mean? How, how, what is the gross margin calculation? And you talked about the expenses. Yeah. In, you know, what in, two or three most, things to look at. Yeah. So in most professional services firms, total billings is your revenue number. Well, in that may be some client expenses. So those come out as cost of goods sold. And you may use, you may bill your customer, anything that you bill your customer for, but I may subcontract out those services from another specialist. So is it another lawyer? Is it another firm? Is it, uh, you know, uh, you know, you name it. So those would be cogs in a law firm case. But in, in a lot of law firms, it may be close to zero. You never travel for your client. You're just always doing services. Okay, well, you're going to have a zero on that cogs line. I still want you to have that because it tells you that there is another way. And so people that get overwhelmed with more sales than they got people to do it, Okay, well, let's find a way to do it. And we run those subcontracted people, you know, through that line. But once I know, see, the thing is, especially in today's world, we, we can't flex labor like we did 40 years ago. You, I mean, you, you pretty much commit to an employee and I got to go sell and keep that employee busy and productive. And so, it, it is one of those that if you know what the, the labor is, the input, the margin is the output. And if I now know I can start every single month, everybody listening to this podcast right now, you know, within a, a rounding error, how much labor you're going to spend in the month of November. Well, just take that number times two, and that's your gross margin target for November. And so then business, business strategy becomes really simple. Have I sold enough and my people produce enough and do I have the right people? And, and, and really in the having sold enough, we get into the discussion of pricing strategy, priced it effectively, you know, because I can, I can sell a bunch of stuff, but if I underprice it, I'm just going to run myself out of business or, or just get by. And it's like, we take too much risk as owners of businesses to just get by. And and we've yet to see people who commit to understanding how to set your targets and perform to those targets. I mean, those, those businesses thrive. Now, sometimes you have to address some really unpleasant things to get there. You know, do you have underperforming staff, underperforming partners even? And are you willing to do something about it and, and really create an, a, you know, a lot of times in the professional services world, there are people that, perceive their value based on what their skill set is, not based on what they produce. Yeah, you got to have a certain skill set, obviously, in a, in a regulated profession, but you better perform. And, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, if you don't perform, something's, something's got to change. And, you know, so can you perform or are you better off suited doing, you know, working someplace else? So one of the lines I liked from your book and your presentation, sales are for show, profits are for dough. Yeah, right. I want to speak to that a little bit. Um, and well, I mean, you know, I mean, you can you can sell a bunch of stuff. Can you get it done? I mean, because like I said, you know, when if if we think of November right now, and you take your total labor you expect to spend in November, multiply times two, that's your gross margin target. The first question is, have I Sold enough. Oh, we got plenty of backlog. Okay, great. I, I can't tell you. I mean, 90 plus percent of the time when somebody tells me they got enough backlog, they still underperform to their target because they didn't get it out the door within that monthly you know, time period. And, and realistically, the problem is, is what I just said. It's a monthly time period. We produce on a monthly basis. We produce on a weekly basis. And the more that you actually get people to think of quit turning business on months, I every week is a productive unit of time. I can actually get get my labor productivity down to the point that you know did did we bill enough this week? Matter of fact, I'm big fans, for, especially for uh, uh, legal practices, any other professional practices. I want you to bill anything that got done this week needs to get billed this week. Bill quickly, bill often. That speeds up cash flow as well. 
but but the fact that completion now when you're doing monthly recurring revenue you know type agreements which in the legal world there's some states that allow retainers like that um they're, they're a little of a okay i'm making a payment but i then have to settle up okay you know but i i you know a few states you know, have, have started to allow more creative you know type billing arrangements much like uh you know what your industry does where hey i'm going to provide you this contracted support and it's not hours based i'm going to charge you two thousand dollars a month and then i'll review all your any contracts and blah 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 you know what is so more more of a you know contract uh legal counsel you know you know for for the company or something something along those lines um you know but but at the end of the day it's it's bill it quickly bill it often but you're you're always maintaining that two to one pace and if i drop below it it tells me that I either have a productivity problem or I've got a pricing and sales problem. If I'm above it, it's called the really powerful thing about labor efficiency measurement is it tells you when you're running hot that, yes, this is great, but you can't do that 52 weeks out of the year. Just don't even think of it. And you, would, you would never have anybody want to work for you. And so we've got to guard against, we, we've got to find, kind of my mantra of late has been, I want to create optimized profitability with the work that I work stream that I have, and I want to look for opportunistic growth. And opportunistic growth can come in multiple forms. Uh, right now, I, I would say that there's business purchase opportunities that are at bargains. That we've had multiple clients. I, I, I've seen more bargain purchases from my clients in the last 18 months than I've seen in 15 years. I mean, so the the yes, there's a handful of businesses out there that get premiums, but a lot of the common businesses that don't typically get premium notice from private investors doesn't mean that it, this is probably the best time it's been in a while for businesses to buy a business on the cheap, do you know, do an earn out you know in terms of a payment, and it it's generally growing by purchase is not the best return on investment as organic growing is, but sometimes I need those people as much as I need the business that they have. And so we, we've seen reasons why people do both. But the idea is, you know, you, you kind of know what's there. Once I, I know I start every month with that target and I, if I'm constantly falling below it, what am I going to do about it? Am I just going to accept that that's the way it is? Well, that's a good way to go out of business. Now, we, we talked a little bit before we started recording about a lot of our clients are the personal injury clients mm -hmm. um, and even, you know, other single event um, type of practice areas. So it's a lot less predictable. You know, what the average cases are $1,000 know, cases that pay the bills and then you get mm -hmm. a million dollar, uh, yeah. you know, car accident or, or a, you know, couple million dollar serious injury, a motorcycle, truck accident. So how do the, those guys schedule and, and plan using your, your methodology? Yeah, really what we've done with some of the, the, the personal injury folks is, is really step back and look at like a rolling 36. Uh, I mean, rolling 12 still for most of them actually is still pretty, pretty stable. You're going to close a reasonable number of cases. So a lot of it, let's kind of, let's kind of break the personal injury world into two groups. You, you've really got the group that primarily settles cases and refers out. And so their threat of litigation is they will refer it out to somebody else to litigate, but they are more, more what we call file turners. You can get the highest labor efficiency ratio it being a file turner uh, uh, personal injury firm. You just always have to find a way to create that threat of taking it to court or else you're not going to get people to settle. But invariably, where you, you have a good marketing program to get cases in and you effectively, quickly identify the issues and present, you know, then you, you're going to, the, the ones that settle quickly, you can make a really good business off of. Like you said, the cases have a tendency. So the time frame that we generally use is three years. I've just got to expect that I've got to I got to work my tail off for three years to build up to my my rolling caseload. And once once I'm there, then I've just got to maintain that. So 
when we get to that rolling three period, we're stepping back and looking at here's my rolling three year rev 36 month revenue. Here's my rolling 36 month labor cost. Here's my rolling marketing spend. And, and there's, you know, we look at marketing effectiveness of if that marketing is delivering the cases, you know, then it's kind of like a hot hand in, in the blackjack. I mean, you feed the hand and, and if it's not working, unfortunately, it's an industry that has to market. I mean, if you don't market, you don't eat. Um, and so the key there is just try something different. Um, and you know, we're, we're not experts in telling people what to do, but we can step back and look at the, the measure of the effectiveness of the spend you know, from that standpoint. But those are the basics of if you can ever build that 36 month caseload and then cases start to, to, they'll still settle prior to litigation a lot of times. We don't, I don't consider that turning a file. Turning a file is something you turn within the first 90 days, you know, that, that you get it and you do a quick settle and, and move on. Once you go past that and then everything goes into that, two to three year bucket, you know, way too often. And, you know, and it just takes a lot of capital, you know, and one, but once you build that base of capital, then it turns over reasonably effectively. Yeah, I think from what I see, like the firms who average like 50 or more cases a month in the personal injury space, they're pretty consistent. Um, and I guess a big part of it is they have a history of cases and past clients who are going to refer them. They have relationships with, uh, you know, other attorneys and, and medical providers who are going to refer a certain number of cases. Um, and, and so that business becomes a little bit more predictable. You know, that you're going to have 50, 60 new cases every month. You're going to settle 40, 50, 60 old cases every month. And that's a more predictable business. I guess it's the smaller guys who who can vary from five to 10 a month to 20, 25. Yeah, yeah they're, they're going to have a lot more volatility, but yeah. the wins are so much more valuable to them because they have they don't have the fixed overhead in in a lot of cases. Now the ones that come out of the ground and try to spend too much money early, you know, they uh, they don't fare too well. So so the idea is you just got to be patient as you build build that base, you know, and get up there. The one thing that I you know for your background, I love your answer you know, on. I've, I've made the statement. It would not shock me if Google zero dollars from paid search in 24 months from now, because why would anybody pay for it when when all search will be AI driven, looking at non influenced information? What's the point of buying Google AdWords, doing um, pay per clicks, and all those things? Well, I mean, one thing Google's done to fight off the Chat GPT and the other. Uh, AI searches is they brought their own organic, you know, AI search results to searches. Right. So now, but, now but these, those, but I would imagine, and you tell, tell me if you, it, it, I'd love your answer on this. Is is Google's AI search results that I now see at the top of the page is are those influenced by paid promotion? Well, Google's always said that that they don't influence their organic and their paid. They've always said church and state are separate. Um, they also had do no yeah. evil as one of their core principles, and they they recently took it out of their, you know, over the last years they've actually taken that out of their corporate yeah. documents. But um, I think you know in, it's in Google's interest. Look at it from their perspective mm. to give you a good answer for what you're searching for. Yeah. And if they can give you the best answer, you're not going to go to Chat GPT yeah. as frequently to answer. You know, like. A year ago, there was questions that ChatGPT answered better than Google. Now, mm -hmm. uh, I think Google, with their AI result, it's as good or even sometimes better than ChatGPT because they use current documentation. The other thing that's interesting for our clients is in those AI overviews in Google's, you know, AI search result, mm -hmm. they're showing their homework. So they're showing the three prominent websites where they got that information from, mm -hmm. and those are clickable. That's an organic search result, like Google's free organic right. SEO. So, although I did, I did a search SEO. on Chat, I did a search on Chat GPT the other day that actually did the same thing. It delivered me the, the, the. Uh, oh, the, they're starting the, to show their yeah. homework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, 
So I think, you know, to, to answer your question, like if Google's still the best place to get answers, and essentially that's why we search. We don't know, we're, we're you know, you and I probably both Google our own, our own company, but mm -hmm. for the most part you're searching something that you don't know the answer to. So if wow. Google has the combination of a chat GPT style answer and the paid and the organic and the maps, and they have the best sort of maps if you want to see who's close to you to provide a service, then people will still go to Google. Then Google has to balance between the, the, the free content and the paid content. Uh, and something we're super focused on is the local service ads, mm -hmm. the Google screened results. So those are right at the top of the page. Um, and there's a click to call. And, you know, a lot of people just want to, you know, they want to call a lawyer and they want to talk to him right away. So Google can present that result as a paid result uh, if, if that's what the consumer wants and if they're giving them what they want. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the answer to the question is like if Google continues to be the best place to answer questions, yeah. they'll be able to serve paid results as a part of that mix. Yeah, and to me, I'm more in, in interested in how does the, the my client get better response rate? Because right now, now part of it, the, the big part of its market, I mean, the market is uh, is the most unresponsive I've seen in quite a while, um, you know, at, at this point. But I do think that as you move towards less sponsored uh, search results. You've got to get better at telling your story um, and getting that information out there. And, you know, and that that's just going to that's got a lot more art to it than science. Um, you know, on, on the, there's a science to the one hand of how the, the search bots find it. But the art is how to elevate and stand out and, and stand above. And and I think that's really where the next marketing battleground will be fought, you know, for these types of businesses that are heavy. I mean, you you got to spend a ton of market. If you don't spend marketing, you've either got a really good source in your pocket somewhere that that's feeding you business. But the vast majority, you know, you're you're having to go out and do hand to hand combat, you know, to find the next your, your next case because there, there's a lot of people, you know, buying for it. Yeah, you're you're right. And something we've been talking a lot about over the past six to 12 months, because we were very transaction focused as a direct marketing agency. So we were all about what's the cost of a lead, but we've been spending a lot more time with our clients on brand. And it's very important for the firm to figure out who they are and what they stand for, yeah. and then deliver that consistently across everything they do. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you know, if we're talking personal injury, like you can be the guys who get you the biggest check. You can be the guys who are the part of the community and really care. You can be the guys who fight the insurance company, but you got to pick one. And then you've got to be that very consistently in all your advertising and marketing, your yeah. website, on your social media, and even in picking the community activities you participate in, which is very, very important um, as we see in, in the yeah. results that, that our guys get. So, um, so one of the concepts that we came up with, and this is in the second book, Simple Numbers 2.0, I talk about this concept of launch capital. And so this applies very much to, to the, the heavy advertising legal uh, marketplace, because essentially the idea is nobody's sticking a gun to your head to make you spend money on marketing. It's a choice. And so and now there's kind of a maintenance level of marketing. And you've probably seen this where somebody comes to you and says, hey, we need to grow. We need you know, we, we got to push on the gas. And so to me. You know, this is kind of a thing that the traditional world of accounting just does not get. And I get the reason why they fall all over themselves dealing with it. But most businesses, especially like these, grow through the P&L, not through the balance sheet. And the idea being that, and unfortunately, personal injury also grows through the balance sheet because you got to wait, you got out of pocket costs. And a lot of times you don't get any money until the end. And so you got to, and there's, do, do, I, do I finance it? Do I pay for it myself? Those are different strategic decisions, you know, but, but, but the idea is I'm making significant investments of an expanse in the present period that does not pay off until some point in the future. And, and, and looking at those to where the idea is we've come up with a process where we strip out the 
extra discretionary spend and we hold it below the net operating income line and said, if we had just spent this, we'd have continued on at the same pace. This money was being spent as a catalyst for growth. We have to, uh, we have to take a step up in pace, not maintain the current pace. And what we look at is once you identify that cost, you can isolate it and then hold it accountable of saying, did it work? And my goal is, in the example in chapter six of the, the 2.0 book you know, goes through this, the goal is, is I want to spend, I want basically in the next accounting period, take that discretionary spend, let's say it's a hundred grand. I should see profit go up in the next period that it paid for the hundred grand and made 50% on top of that. And to me, that's a minimum acceptable win. Now, you won't win all the time because it, it's not science. You know, it, it's something that you've got to do, but you've got to be able to measure it and go, the reason why you need a 50% win rate or 50% return rate is because I'm not going to win 100% of the time. But when I do win, and the example I show in the book, one of the years they got a 400% return on that bet. And it was very much worth it. In the case study I show in the book, which would fit perfectly for a law firm, this business grew from 700000 to $10 million in five years and was profitable every year and didn't borrow a dime to deal with that growth. Fantastic. And it's like, okay, I want me some of that. That's, 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 <laughs> some, that's some good business. Yeah, you see my smile. So um, if someone's just starting out, should they win, read? the two books consecutively, or can you skip ahead to 2.0? No, I mean, if you're starting out, the first book is the the absolute, I mean, you got to read it because it's it's more of a mindset book and it's going to give you the simplest parameters, you know, that, that we deal with. The second book is once you cross a million dollars in revenue, okay, now let's, let's go to the second book, you know, and, and start applying some of these because the, the problem is, is at a million, you're you don't have a diverse enough team to where you can kind of see the fields in front of you. you. You're not blind mostly, you know, to what's going on. Once you get past a million, you got a couple of partners. Okay. We, we've got to have some different metrics. We've got to cater to people in a very logical fashion of them understanding you get paid a salary for what you do. You get a return on what you own. Don't confuse the two. And this is whether it's lawyers, accountants, architects, engineers, doctors they all screw this up you've got to have a bifurcation of compensation to where i'm i'm paid for this thing this role that i'm doing it may be administrative it may be billable i don't really care if, if that person got run over by a bus tomorrow and you hired a person with no equity to do their task what would you pay them that's what that person should make and unfortunately, we all just cram all that in there together, and it it really creates a, a a constraint to clear understanding of how profit is created, how the entity should be stable itself rises above the individuals, you know. In in that now, if you're a sole a sole owner, sole practitioner, okay, you know, you don't you have a you have a book of business, you don't have a business, and and so. Okay, you know that there, there's a there's a value to that, and unfortunately, there's a, there's generally a finite value in the legal and accounting world. You know what that book of business practitioner stuff is worth. Um, you know, but yeah, at least the law world is. You guys are not as in bad a shape as the accountants. I think the last data I heard was for every CPA that passes the exam, we have five that are retiring. That does not end well. I can just tell you. So there's a, a massive shortage. It is. Oh, yeah. and it, and and it and it's getting more red line critic. I mean, we certainly a lot of firms like even ours have national labor to some degree. Yeah. Sometimes with questionable results. Um, you know, but but it it's you know in in some of the the professions, I I don't know what the rate of passing the bar is. You know, at the moment. But I would still imagine, even in the legal world, you got more people retiring with a law license than you have people that are getting the next new one. Would be my guess. Yeah, I don't know those numbers, but I know everybody's looking for good lawyers. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, 
how, can you explain simply like what's the difference between you know your traditional accountant and the simple numbers way so i mean a, a, a traditional accountant number one is only going to talk to you at the end of the year to get your financials to file a tax return maybe produce a simple financial statement to give to the bank uh to to back up your line of credit um and all of those they'll set you up on a uh a safe harbor estimated tax schedule uh and and that that's the routine um call them and ask them a question and they'll send you a bill you know for answering the question in our case what we says is no you know we're going to help you run a better business the first thing that when somebody works with us we do a planning session and those can we for smaller businesses we we make it a little more compressed and, and a, a little more affordable the the larger businesses still still isn't very expensive uh, you know that we'll do a, a day long session or a couple of zoom calls to get all the data in but essentially replay to them here's your data of what has happened and here's where you're at today and show it to them in our structure so we believe the simple numbers presentation of data tells the story of the business whereas traditional financial reporting does not and we get down to just the handful of numbers that really matter and then from there we can say now is this is this performance acceptable to you or not what what are your problems what are your challenges and and so we go through a process to to help them understand here here are the actionable things that that you can do partly based on our experience of working with us in, in similar nature um you know and help them set those goals and objectives that are measurable and then on a monthly basis we get their data um and update the model hold a call and, and measure that progress toward performance those that are a little short of back office help we have a client accounting service team that can do some outsourced bookkeeping as needed uh, to support that process but we don't deploy the way the way our office works if you don't come through the consulting door we don't do anything for you i won't i won't deploy tax resources i won't deploy bookkeeping resources unless you're a consulting client and then but we do everything in fixed price as well so we don't we don't bill by the hour um you know and and so so we'll quote you the price and it is what it is and um and i think that's you know what you're what you're getting and and the idea being our thought first and foremost is help you to be profitable now what happens when you're profitable i basically have three forces fighting against my profitability the first one i need to take care of is setting aside my taxes because that one has a big stick they, they're slow they, they move really slowly but when they want to whack you it hurts so just don't mess with them the second one my business needs capital so if you're in that growing stage especially as a personal injury firm yeah i'm profitable but i need to retain that profit to fund i'm not to my optimal caseload so i've got to reinvest in my business until i hit that maintenance level the third thing is i have financial needs personally well here's the deal get you to pay yourself a market wage for the job that you're doing I don't I, I should not be living off of profit distributions that's a personal consumption problem not a business problem but I want you to pay yourself the real market wage because here's the thing I found Jay you will defend your paycheck 10 times more than you'll defend the bottom line profit of a business it, it, it is personal if you have to skip a paycheck because there's not enough cash in the business to write a check and and so it tends to create focus but let's face it lawyers aren't exactly top of the rung in terms of quickly getting their billings out and keeping the cash flow going and so hey don't bill and you don't collect you don't eat these are physics and and so what we want to do is align everybody in the firm to understand for all of us to get paid on a consistent basis and stay in the game and be a thriving business the trains must run on time and that, was that three or four was was there a fourth principle uh no no uh, well the, the so that so like i said taxes is the first demand on yeah. that profit Retain, retaining cash is the second demand 
And then your personal needs of, of if I need distributions to cover my consumption, you know, I'd like to fix that a different way, you know, if I can. But I mean, we have clients that they're, they just have a, a personal consumption habit that just understand if your consumption habit exceeds what the business can produce, you have a, you built your house on sand, not rock. You got it. Something. All right. I love it. So um, I, we, we've done this podcast for about 15 years, took a little break, but yeah. uh, I've been asking this question for a long time. These are our one liners at the end. Okay. Uh, right. So do you have any apps or techniques you use personally for personal productivity? You know, for me, it's, it's mostly just uh, just outlook and but it's. It's using outlook the right way. And so about 10 years ago, I freed myself from the to-do list. So I, I don't, I don't have a to-do list. I have a calendar and the calendar is both task and appointment driven. And so my technique is something stays in my inbox until I act on it. And fortunately I have an assistant that, you know, I can quickly forward an email and say, Hey, put this on my calendar, find it and, and, and whatever. But living by the calendar has become extremely freeing because I go to sleep every night and don't worry about it because I wake up and do whatever was on my calendar the next day. And because if you schedule prep, I don't, I just have to show up in the meeting because I, I know I've scheduled, I'm, I'm already ready for the meeting. And, and so when everything's working the right way, I mean, that is, that, that, that's just been huge, you know, because now I have to remember to schedule personal time. Uh, because it's easy to let business, you know, kind of, you know, you know uh, chew into availability. So you got to set parameters. But I mean, it's it's the greatest tool ever, you know. And I think we just don't you we just don't exit we won't interface with it, you know, in the most optimal way. Is that the books? Did you schedule time for writing? I did I did, I did w uh, writing retreats? So I'd go away for a weekend, and I'd have before I could go do anything fun, I'd have to get up and write so many words you know, each, each day, but that was the only way the books got done. I love it. Um, so obviously we recommend your two books. Uh, what business books do you recommend for, you know, maybe an attorney starting out or someone who's you got to read so, this? So the, the odd one that I love right now is, uh, it's a book called quit, uh, Q U I T by any Duke. Uh, cause really if, if I was going to go back to college right now, I'd get a doctorate in behavioral economics. Because, I mean, that is the field that fascinates me because, I mean, a lot of the government people just don't know how to apply the human part of the equation to supply and demand in, in various economic concepts and theories. Um, so, so I think that one, you know, is certainly one. Um, an odd one. Um, that will, will show up in another category uh, is Peter Zion's book, uh, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. I, I, I think everybody needs to read that book to get a mental reset of why the next 10 years is and 20 years is not going to be like the last 20. We're, we're, in a, we're, we're in a time like none other in the history of the world, much less the history of the U.S. And so you've, you're, you're playing a team that you don't have film on. And so you've got to be able to, to put your resources out there and you've got to have more than ever. You got to have your data antennas up, watching movement and be an early mover opportunity and risk prevention, uh, you know, of your business. And if you're not, I mean, you're, you're missing this demographic shift of labor and how the market's going to have to react to that. Thank you. I'll add that to my big stack of books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's um, actually, it's actually not, a, it, it's a good audio book to listen yeah. to. He's a very entertaining speaker. You know, so, uh, yeah. And um, what blogs, podcasts, YouTubes do you subscribe to? And when they hit your feed, like, oh, I'm, I'm yeah. stopping this podcast, I'm going to listen to this guy. Well, actually, Peter has a daily blog. He's actually just recently moved it from, uh, you can still get the free one, but it's one week delayed. Uh, but he has a daily one on Patreon that you pay a small subscription fee to. But he's been the most accurate and informative economic person that I follow. Um, 
and I still have a, a, a daily regimen that I, I scan the, the Wall Street Journal's headlines, you know, every day, you know, it takes about 10, 15 minutes. But still, Wall Street Journal is the gold standard of business publication. Uh, I mean, they're not perfect, you know, but they, they had a little dip about five, six years ago, but they, I, I feel like they've really gotten back to don't tell me what to think. Just give me information. And, and so I think they're doing the best job right now of the, of the stuff that I read on a regular basis. When I have a handful of people I kind of follow on Twitter, um, you know, that gives me kind of early, you know, uh, early alert to things. Uh, there's a guy called the Huntsman, uh, that is a, a um, uh, he, he's, he's a logistics expert and I, I found, and, and he doesn't post all the time, but he kind of comes and goes whenever there's a, like he's posting a good, the, uh, dock worker strike. Uh, and, but I've learned a lot about logistics just following his post, you know, in, in, in that response. Uh, obviously you can't, you, you can't not miss Elon Musk. Uh, Elon has some of the most, uh, interesting posts, uh, you know, out there. Uh, and what he, and, what he reposts. I think he posts, but he, well, in some of his direct posts, too. Yeah. 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 But, but I the, think, uh, I think he I've, gets information on what's super hot and then he mm -hmm. reposts it. And so it's like, how does he, yeah. how does he always know what's super hot? <laughs> well, but he's got his hot button issues. I mean, he's a big one on elevating everybody's understanding of this population, you know, crisis that, uh, I, you know, I don't think any of us really know how that plays out because we, the only time that world population ever went backwards in modern history was during the bubonic plague, which ushered in the industrial age because I couldn't just throw bodies at every problem. And, and so, you know, we're in that. I mean, certainly AI is beginning to take that slack, you know, but it's, it's a lot of the easy wins in labor have already been taken. And, and so a lot of it is just kind of how things play out, you know, really, really from here. You know, in that process. So I, I ask most people what their NFL team is, but you're from Alabama and you're wearing wearing a, a Tide sweatshirt. So that's right. Yeah, yeah. My my uh, professional yeah. team that I back is Alabama, although we are very much smarting from a loss to Vandy. But uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what we're made of this week. And did mostly follow your guys when they get to the NFL then? Oh yeah, yeah. Because I, I like all NFL teams because almost all of them have some Alabama players. You know, so uh, yeah. So. For while there five or six were going in the first round um yeah. and and what's a great introduction for you like who who's a great prospective client that we all could could introduce you to really for us i mean our, our focus we don't we, i mean we we have buckets of clients in just about every industry uh what we like to work with are privately held entrepreneurial minded business they want to optimize their business we don't care whether your your goal is to grow, but we do believe in profitability. And so no matter whether you're going to stay in your niche and you need you know tools to optimize that, if you want to grow, okay, we can help you model out growth and kind of what the economic impacts of that are, um, you know, and those types of things. But any privately held business, you know, that is, you know, if you if if you as the CEO feel like you're not getting Visioning, visioning data to run your business by to make clear decisions of going, I, you know, you need to know this is a bet and I put the money in and I have a stop loss somewhere. I better know where that stop loss is. And Annie Duke tells this really cool story. Well, it's a tragic story. Um, this longtime guy, uh, for the climbing Mount Everest. You know, was, um, he had a, a client he'd taken a couple of times and hadn't made it. And this guy, this is probably this guy's last chance. And so they, 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 they get to the base, the final base camp and then they ascend. And there's a standing rule. If you don't get to this certain spot by two o'clock in the afternoon or something like that, you know, you turn around and go back. The only time that guy had violated, he died and his client died. And, and, and it shows that they didn't have to die. I mean, they, they should have followed what the, the the guidance was. And a lot of times we get into hero syndrome and, you know, it's like, stop it. You know, there, there's valuable, if, if there ever was a time, I mean, there are valuable things that everybody can do in today's economy. And so just back up and rethink 
and then reset and then then move forward. But I see a lot of entrepreneurs that make these bets to try to change their business, and they just don't turn off that cost when give a, a specified time for that to work or not, or else we we do something different. Last question: Where can people get in touch with you? Uh, the best spot is um, uh, email uh, Greg Crabtree at Simple Numbers C R I dot com. Uh, I have a speaker website as well uh, and for the book and, and speaking engagements, uh, gregcrabtree.net, uh, all one word. Um, and so uh, those would be kind of the easiest places, um, you know, to, to find me. But um, I'm like the easiest person to find in the world. So if you Google either Greg Crabtree or Simple Numbers, you know, our videos that I mean, there, there's a lot of podcasts I've done, a lot of videos that people have recorded. That, that's, that's a great place to start. Uh, we have a podcast on our Simple Numbers uh, CRI.com website that you know, people can go back and listen to where we hit certain topics. And one of the things a lot of people might you know, find interesting, every every month we'll do an update on what we see in the economy. So we have a 100-company model that is about a billion dollars of revenue that we update every month that is our trusted view of what's actually happening in the economy. And to nobody's surprise, it's slightly different than what the government says. So, Greg, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. I always enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to the 10 Golden Rules of Internet Marketing for Law Firms podcast. Please send questions and comments to podcast at 10goldenrules.com. That is podcast at 10goldenrules.com. 